So I should start off by saying welcome back to Woolworths. Uh, if, if you look at the industry in Australia, and I don't care what industry you look at, a healthy industry is structured around two strong players and a whole stack of SMEs below who fight for innovative uh, products to be uh, lodged within the marketplace. If you look at supermarkets, I mean Woolworths and Coles, very strong, Aldi, uh, IGA. If you look at food companies, if you look at chocolate manufacturers, breakfast cereal, it doesn't matter what category, airlines, transport companies, uh, petrol, you'll find two strong companies and you'll always find SMEs. Even when you look at universities, if you go to the states, in, in the university sector, there's always, except Tassie. Tassie's always unique, I know. It's, 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 uh, every, everyone says when I first used to come here, well, Tasmanians are different. Uh, so except for universities, I'll accept that Tassie's a, a, a unique property. Um, but in every other state, a university, research institutions, there's always two strong ones, and then there's a whole stack of SMEs. So it's a dynamic with the industry. And it's really important when you look at that for us. So Food, Food Innovation Australia is a company set up by industry, and it's a great situation because we spend government money. So we're funded by government to implement innovation programs and get cultural change within the food industry. So what Scott was talking about in fruit and veg in particular with Woolies as the fresh fruit people. That's really important to us and, you know, like horticulture and if you look at world markets, this is a critical area of opportunity for Australia and I'll go into that a little bit later. But outside of fresh fruit and veg, if, if you, again you take this uh, uh, small to mediums and then you take the, uh, the big companies, the engine room for innovation is demonstrated time and time again to come from SMEs. And that's where we work. So we've defined the market, we've done a lot of work. We started in 2013 under the Labor government. I'm now working for my eighth minister in four years, so there's a lot of stability in uh, FIAL. Uh, I think we're up to our sixth prime minister in that period as well, or might be fifth. Um, but there is a level of innovation that we're trying to identify and bring up and then connect with the supermarkets, with export markets as well. And was it Bryce, was it? Or? So we're currently working. I mean, I think Mariana's already had meetings with Woolworths, but uh, I'm, I'm aware of a program with Coles that we now take SMEs, we take Coles, and we want to do it with Woolworths as well take them around the country and introduce them to these known innovative SME companies that have difficulty actually engaging with the two big players in, in the marketplace. And you know, how, how do we make that work? Because the connection is critical. I've got some stats around what the market's like and it, it'll give you a bit of an idea uh, of the food and agri business. So we're called Food uh, Industry Australia, Food Innovation Australia Limited, but we're the Food and Agribusiness Growth Centre. So that's the official government name for it. So it covers from anything to do with inputs into agriculture, so research that you would be working on in, in this horticultural space, whether it's genetics, whether it's agronomics, whatever it is, as long as all of that work is driven from a consumer perspective or a market perspective, and that's critical. So for us to be involved and provide funds, and we've got, I mean, I've got a fund sitting there now of about $6 million, which when matched by industry and universities will come out at over $10 million, and that will uh, continue to exist at around 5 to $6 million a year. And if you start to think of what I was saying about small to mediums, that's a lot of money that can go in to small to mediums to encourage innovation. Some of the stats though, the food and agricultural industry has 178,000 individual companies registered with, uh, or, well, individual companies recognised by government through the ATO. 
Of those, 120,000 don't employ anyone. Their mum and pop, their family farms, like our family farm, and we grow grains and rice and a bit of irrigation. And my stuff goes down the silo at the local railway heading, goes off, I've no idea where it goes, I don't know what market it goes to, and, you know, we're not. Uh, one of the people that FIAR would want to deal with, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So 100 and, 178, 120 don't employ, so we're left with 60,000 companies that employ uh, someone else. And if they're employing someone else, they're more capable of innovating as well. If you look at the structure of the market, we employ 520,000 people within this sector, which is 4.5% of the total employment in Australia. The sales and services income from it is $164 billion, which is 5.9. And I'm dwelling a bit on stats, but I'm just trying to build a story for you. Um, if you look at the gross value add of this sector, it's only 3.5% of the total gross value add, which is taking it from the farm, adding value through packaging, transport, whatever it is. We only account for three in, in the whole food and agribusiness sector. But in the area of exports, we're 16.3% or $40 billion out of this sector. And what that's telling you is that the gross value add, which is where the innovation mostly comes from in packaged products into supermarkets, is a tiny percentage of our export market, which is non-value added commodity products. So the wheat that I was talking about that goes off to Australia, we use 10%, 90% gets exported. In meat it's a similar sort of statistic. Uh, in rice it's a similar statistic. We don't value add, it goes off to world markets without being value added. And that's an issue. So when Fial looks at the industry, we're trying to say we need to start looking at value add driven by consumer perspective. And your loyalty program and the ability to get that information back and you're saying you make decisions daily, that's what we want to try and do as well with the export market because we are linked in and we now have um, trolls within uh, networks of data within Asian markets so that you can go on to our e-commerce platform on Fial and you can actually identify, say, what's the biscuit market in Singapore this week? And next week you can go in and do whatever it is, fresh fruit and veg or something in China or southern China. So we're using data like that as well. Uh, we haven't yet, we'll sit down and talk about how we might get access to Australian data. Um, we, we, um, we remove, you know, the identity of where it's coming from, so it's generalised data and we can get reports. So it sort of comes down to uh, an analysis of the food and agribusiness market within Australia. If you look at it, there are some issues. Um, I think, Ian, you referred to it. Out of the OECD top 30 companies, we're 29th and 30th respectively in terms of translating or transferring research from universities into industry and we're the 30th on our ability to collaborate. And you talk collaborate, you talk collaborate daily. Australia is demonstrably one of the worst in the OECD countries to collaborate. And without proper collaboration, we're not going to solve the problem. So the drivers for FIAL in analysing the market are knowledge, capability and collaboration. It's a very simple strategy, but that's what the basis of our whole thing is about. Knowledge I started to talk about, but we also teach companies how to export. So we have an export readiness program. They go online, they assess themselves, we then work with them to build up the gaps. At the end of a day's workshop, they come out with an export marketing plan. When we're dealing with 60,000 small companies within the country, and you know, I, I should have mentioned that, 80 per cent of the food we eat goes through the supermarkets, and of that, the majority comes from about 200 companies, and most of them are multinationals overseas owned. 
So when you start to look at how do I influence the innovative capacity of Australia, we've got to actually drive towards SMEs. So it really is to horticulturalists, it is to growers, it is to small manufacturers, because with proper collaboration built into the system, that sort of knowledge can actually build up through small companies working with big companies along the supply chain. And then you start to get enough momentum and enough capacity and enough volume to start to satisfy the likes of Woolworths and Coles. Because uh, there are markets out there for, for niche stuff. I mean, I've just come back from uh, Europe and America and had a look at supermarkets. And the you know, organic is a huge category. So is gluten free. All the free from stuff is really growing. And but the, on the flip side, and I think Scott, you mentioned it as well, the flip side, so we're talking about opportunities for Australia. The flip side is the non-health. If you look at, and I've worked in the food industry, I worked for Westerns and Goodman Fielder, and if you sit back and reflect on our, I, I was going to say responsibility, I'll say culpability of big companies like Westerns, Coke, any ones you want to mention, the way that we have developed and driven bad food into the society is quite culpable. So it's no wonder that we've flipped in terms of what consumers now want. They want health. But you then get this uh, incredible situation where you'll be driving health and wellness and freshness, but the bulk of the products that are still being sold out of companies like I work with are unhealthy. So extremely high sugar, extremely high um, fructose, not, uh, corn fructose syrups, extremely high refined carbohydrates. Um, you know, it's no wonder that with health declining at the rate it is around obesity, di diabetes, uh, hypertension. They're all food related. And there, you know, if I start to talk about where is the future for innovation within Australia, it will come from that area. I've just come back from Israel and I led a trade delegation of food and agriculture people and MLA had a couple of people there and horticulture Australia was there as well. And we were quite amazed at what we saw in Israel um, around, particularly in horticulture, I've got to say. There are so many areas of research that are coming out, but they're all driving towards health. So all the things like you know, cherry tomatoes, all the kumatos, the block, uh, blocky uh, capsicums that they've got, all the different, they all come out of Israel. Uh, all the drip irrigation, the greening of the desert, the technology around glass houses, they're calling it nutrigation now, so putting really controlled nutrition into drip irrigation, things like uh, understanding, and I, I talked about health, the, and you know, I'm speaking to people here that will know more than I do about it, but we now know that the gut and the health of your gut is so critical to the health of the human uh, body anyway. Um, and you start to think of the statistics that my body consists of, I think it's 10 to the 12th cells, but the number of bugs, cells, that I have in my gut is 10 to the 13th. And on the surface of my skin, I have another 10 to the 8th. So of this organism that I claim to be Peter, my genetic makeup constitutes less than 1% of it. So to Talk about understanding how your gut and the flora on your body influences your health. You're actually feeding these bugs to make yourself healthy. So to understand that and to understand innovative capacities and capabilities is where the opportunities come. If you go, I mean, Israel are now looking at, well, what are the bugs in the root zone? What are the bugs on the surface? And they're actually now in the drip irrigation adding bugs that are altering the microbiome within the root zone and improving yields, improving nutrient take up and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, in, in terms of uh, centre here, 
there's great opportunities there. Um, the other area, so obviously through the local supply chain and, and the value chain, and I'm sure uh, when you talk about freshness, that immediately takes you to the supply chain, the value chain, and that's where a lot of the research will start to take place. Um, you know, Tassie with its incredible production of salmon and getting it into markets, I mean, lobsters and things like that. So things like packaging, um, active packaging, new technologies around metal inclusions into packaging at uh, Food Pro uh, in July. There's a company from Perth who came out of the mining industry uh, uh, launching a new packaging with a copper film within it, just embedded in it, that's uh, theoretically supposed to double the shelf life of fresh produce. I don't know how it works yet, but there's some electrostatical arrangements going on. But there are research areas like that that are, that are just going to open up huge opportunities. So for shortening of supply chains, uh, preservation of quality, naturally, preservation of quality. The other thing I saw which was interested me in America was non-GM, the home of GM and you go into the supermarket scene, it's not just, uh, uh, it's not just the, the, the organic sort of specialists. It's you know, people like Farmer Joe's, Jewel, Kroger. I mean, they've all got large sections on their shelf now with non-GM, which creates a challenge for us as well. Uh, i probably flip aside and uh, talk about my board for a bit. My board and the reason she's there is because of a presentation she did here in Tasmania, is Jane Bennett. And Jane was on CSIRO and ABC board and Nuffield and she's a, a well-known Australian foodie and still involved in the industry. I was at a conference with her and she got up in front of Tasmanians who voted to have no GM in the state like South Australia has, and they're the only ones. So uh, she got up and said, we can't shut our minds off to GM. We've got to start to look at using GM, gene switching, whatever, you know, uh, to be able to meet the pace, the accelerated pace of innovative capacity to, uh, to provide new products, healthy products for the market. So I, I was quite impressed with Jane. So when I formed the board, I thought, I want someone that's got a bit of spark. So I went to Jane and said, will you join the board? So she's the Tassie representative, which is great. I think. Not sure if you were there, Rob. No, no. Okay. So MLA, Chancellor of the University, Charles Sturt University, Chairman of MLA is on the board. Terry O'Brien, who's the chair of AFGC, and the managing director of Simplot, who's actually leaving in a few months' time, moving on and handing over. But Simplot, under his reign, are one of the last remaining innovative multinational companies left in Australia. Um, uh, Jeff Starr, who was managing director of Westerns but worked in Asia, worked in Europe with Mars Corporation, is on Food Bank Board and on Pork Limited. So I, I'm only mentioning those because you can get a feel for the representation across the agriculture and food industry that drives what we do. Um, what time have I got? Ah, oh, right. I do tend to go over. That's why I never do slides, because uh, when I do slides, I bog down on them. Anyway, so FIAL is looking at culture, is looking at connections, is looking at collaborations, and you will not get effective collaboration, effective innovation, unless you get those things right. Knowledge, capabilities, so working with universities to build up capabilities of the industry, to understand those technologies, but collaboration is critical, absolutely critical. If you look around the world, Tassie's in a perfect spot in Australia. If you look around the world, the most innovative countries are countries that either have an existential threat like Israel or have a burning platform. They're on the edge of another big country. So if you look, Scotland, uh, Catalonia in Spain with the rest of Spain, the Basque Country, Lyon in Paris, Denmark, Canada. Uh, 
if you look at all of those countries and look where they sit in a geographical zone, they're under threat from huge America, Germany, etc., cetera, or, or you know, the rest of France. And they're driven to innovate, to find that little niche, that capability that gives them something different. And Tassie is that place. Your population of half a million is one and a half percent of Australia's population. It's the same percentage as Australia's is of China. When I come to Tassie and people here talk about exporting to China, I say to people in, in Australia, why would you even bother thinking, for Australia, let alone Tassie, think of exporting to China? I've said to them when the uh, previous uh, minister here, um, think of a village in China with a population of $2 million and you've just multiplied your market by four times. You know, they're the sorts of cultural differences you need to approach. So Tassie's in a perfect position with this, with all of your university here focused. You've got one university focusing on everything that Tassie needs. Well, that's what it should be doing. And that gives you a great scope and capacity to actually grow your product productivity, your labour, utilisation, the whole thing, the wealth of, the, of uh, Tassie. And we'll be working with you as well. Thank you, Peter.